So in case I, uh, let me just say now, quiz isn't quite ready yet. Um, mostly a matter of making notation and whatnot consistent with what I've been using in class. Um, so I should be able to get that up for say five o'clock. I'll get it somehow. Um, but as has become somewhat usual, I will post an announcement when it goes live on Canvas. Um, before then, it's automatically set to sort of hit you at whatever is already there. So wait for the announcement to get the actual quiz. Um, and I will have your last times quizzes back to you Monday. All right. So we have we were yeah. We started talking last time about stream profiles, and let me remind you of the questions that I posed for us to try to answer out of all this stuff, okay? Um, we started off with what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for a channel head and, and kind of also more generally just a, a channel. Um, and then we, I asked, well, why or how do channels form branching networks? And then I asked, well, what do the answers tell us? In particular, I was interested in things like do origins, that is, mountain ranges, have predictable dimensions? Do they have predictable time scales of formation? Um, and why do mountains last so friggin' long? Uh, that is, why do mountains, or let me say, do mountains have a predict have predictable time scales of decay? I sort of threw out the teaser that, you know, Taiwan seems to reach a steady width after about four million years, yet we still have the highlands in Scotland, the Ozarks, the Appalachians, etc., which are hundreds of millions of years old. Um, now, unfortunately, I'm going to have to, I'm not going to pretend like I'm going to be able to answer those today. But I do want to get to those questions, though. I think it's um, it's important to, to think about those things, but um, we've got some more groundwork to, to lay down. Because we kind of answered the first two questions. That is, you know, what's, what do we need for a channel head, and what's sufficient, and why do we have branching networks, or how do the branching networks form? Because um, I laid out, okay, here's a simplification of the mass balance and our erosion equation. If I plug this into the model, look, it forms a branching network, um, presto. And on some level, you know, it may not seem too awfully profound, but that's kind of the answer. I mean, because it is advantageous for streams to be of larger contributing areas, so areas aggregate, you get the branching network. It's kind of inevitable. Um, but when we looked at that first question of what are necessary and sufficient conditions to maintain a channel, um, I kind of threw out there that, well, you need to be able to transport, of course, you know, in the case of Chip Ross Park, you need to be able to move away what the gophers provide. Uh, but then I kind of skipped ahead to say, well, let's, um, let's imagine a case where we've got a bedrock stream and we're going to simplify things and say, um, but it, that since it's hard to, to carve the bedrock, <coughs> I'm going to be breaking off bits of that at a rate that transport capacity is always going to be sufficient to carry away. Right? So we're always going to, in that simpli simplified view, transport capacity is always big enough to move away the bits of rock that we pull out. Um, now, I didn't call it, or I didn't tell you at the time, but such a channel 
uh, is an N member characterizing what is known as detachment limited erosion. So, let's write that down. That is uh, the erosion rate, or the dz dt in our equation, is limited by the rate at which the flow and its tools can remove pieces of the bed. Where that removal is typically thought to be resisted by, say, the cohesion, the strength of the rock, right? A harder rock going to be harder to erode. So maybe the tensile strength of the rock, that's, that's been found as a, a reasonable variable to represent that, that resistance. But it could also be even like bad line stuff, you know, where it's, where it's say, clay that's not rock exactly, but uh, does have enough cohesion to resist erosion. Uh, and there, so that, so that we've always got the transport capacity to move the muddy water that that's formed by the water running over the clay. Okay, so um, when we did that, we said, okay, the change in elevation with time is just going to be the balance between any rock uplift we've got and erosion of the bed. And so you might recall that we had, we simplified our mass balance down to rock uplift and erosion. and just wrote this as uplift minus erosion. That's our change in elevation with time. Um, now, we quickly moved on to say, let's replace erosion with something suitable for a stream. Um, and in particular, we made that to be <coughs> this function of contributing area and stream gradient or slope. So, and then we have some mis somewhat mysterious, but we can talk about what goes into K, and I hope to get to what goes into K today. But, okay, you know, things like the precipitation rate, things like the rock hardness, those are going to figure in. And... You know, so we've got these variables that are going to vary across the landscape, contributing area, slope. We've got our constants m and n and k, representing things that are more or less constant, like precipitation rate or some sort of typical storm magnitude that we figure is constant over whatever watershed we're trying to figure out. Okay, now recall that, you might recall, recall, try to think back, to when we started talking about diffusive processes on hill slopes. And we made a distinction at that time between <coughs> soil mantled slopes and bedrock slopes. And we generally considered only the soil mantled ones, right? We said, well, in terms of figuring out transport processes, let's never mind the bedrock ones because they're always steep enough for stuff to just fall off anyway. Um, so does anyone recall what we called those two cases? So when we had hill slope types, you might recall that we had one that we called weathering limited. These were our bedrock slopes. And we gave it that name Y. Well, 
Well, we, we gave it the name <coughs> Weathering Limited because, in general, the lowering rate or the erosion rate on that slope is not limited by the capacity for transport, but rather by the rate at which weathering processes could break down the rock or detach bits of the rock. And we figured, you know, this sort of slope, the transport capacity is always going to be capable of moving whatever is detached by weather. And I'm kind of on purpose using using a word that I'm also using <coughs> over here. So, all right. Um, the other case, the soil mantle case, we call transport limited. And again, these were our soil mantle slopes. Because the erosion or lowering rate of that slope is limited by the rate at which the detached material can be removed or transported. And so we had to think of things like, well, okay, you know, diffusion equation, because uh, we, the net change in elevation is, is what comes in minus what goes up. And so if we have a steepening slope in that case, then we can get erosion. We said, well, and that's why we would predict erosion for convex ridges, deposition for concave toe slopes. And we specifically talked about that rate of erosion would, you know, for a landscape that was generally eroding, if we look at the sharpness of those ridges, that's going to tell us about the, the overall erosion rate in that landscape. Remember? And that was based on this transport limitation, the fact that we have to do the full mass balance of n minus f. Can't rely on some huge uh, rate at which we remove stuff. So, in the case of streams, the detachment limited case here is analogous to this weathering limited case on hill slopes. And Now, if in our mass balance for a stream bed, we can't just assume that transport capacity is ample, however much stuff we need to remove, then we move toward the other end member, which like the hill slope, we call transport limit. So over here, Again, this is in the stream. Sorry. Let's go to the mass balance then, because uh, we don't have to spend a huge amount of time on it, because it's kind of the same in some sense as we dealt with already for hill slopes. But let's let's do that. So, uh, in the farthest end member, sort of. Whereas here, you know, this surface was supposed to be bedrock. In the transport limited case, then, you know, make sure I draw in my flowing water, which I should have drawn in over here, just to remind us that we're dealing with the stream. Here, let's just say the ultimate end member is an arbitrarily deep pile or column of unconsolidated material. Yeah, this is an idealization. This is an end member case. In reality, you know, maybe we would have some bedrock down there, but uh, let's just consider what happens in the case where it's all unconsolidated, or at least acts like it is. So, in that case, if I If I call the, you know, this is x and this is x plus delta x, um, and I draw my boundaries <laughs> like so, 
and I've got uh, sediment flux at x uh, in, I've got sediment flux out at x plus delta x. Probably see what's coming by now that, oh, well, one thing we didn't, I didn't necessarily draw in with the hill slopes is, let's go ahead and keep in the fact that we might have a rock uplift term providing us some material from below. Just by the time it gets to the surface, it's unconsolidated. Okay. Um, so now any change in that bed elevation is contingent on the downstream change in transport capacity, just like with our hill slope diffusion. So that is our mass balance assumes a, what should be a relatively familiar form at this point. That is our change in elevation with time. Here we've got uplift. So it's the, the result of uplift minus the erosion represented by this, which is the rate at which the flux rate can increase as we go downstream. Okay, So you might recall that for hill slopes, for this Q sub S, we just put in something that was proportional to local slope. We didn't have, we assumed we didn't have running water to help us out. And that gave us a pretty simple final result of a diffusion equation. Now, so, well, that you might ask, well, then what, how is it different for streams? Whereas with slopes, the transport capacity was simply proportional to slope, things are not quite so simple with streams. So for streams, so we're going to use a transport law that's similar to the one that we use for erosion over here. After all, they're both just based on shear stress, right? I mean, that was where we started. And I said, well, you know, plucking blocks, just say, you know, shear stress is the thing, and that's going to lead to this sort of form. After we turn through some math, let's just skip the churning part and write up the simple answer. <coughs> Similarly, let's do the same now. Um, I got the wrong thing. Let's, uh, let's write down a nice general transport equation it's going to look awfully similar to that one because it's almost exactly the same. So we're going to say, in this case, Q sub S is, again, proportional to contributing area to a power and slope to a power. Now, rather than mess around with putting subscripts on my M's and N's that are already small and exponents, um, I'm just going to tell you that these in general, this M and this N are different from these values over here. But this is the one that's determining sort of the rate at which you can tear at bedrock. So it might, in general, be a different, uh, different sort of equation, or at least have different values of these exponents than this one that's talking about how much transport it can be. And you've seen. Uh, in your lab, you know, you saw that total load equation that had transport as a function of discharge to like the 1.7 and slope to the 1.65 and had other stuff in there like grain diameter and roughness and channel width and so on. So, and we talked last time about how, well, if, if it's if discharge is the thing, then we can, on some level, substitute contributing area. And I'll, but I'll talk about how that gets a bit complicated. All right. So that means that I can write this puppy here down as 
go ahead and take another line here. So I'm going to say this is constant. So I'm going to go ahead and bring it out. So I'm going to have a ratio of kt over rho b. Uh, I've got my d by dx of qs. Since this is complicated, I'm going to write my d by dx here. Put it in brackets. And, uh, and okay, so kt, no, I already took that out. A to the m, s to the n. Um, let's try to get a bit of a handle on how this, we might expect an equation like this to behave. Just roughly speaking. Because we've talked about, well, this, in the case of hill slopes, led to a diffusion equation. So, if we have, if, n is greater than or equal to 1, then we can write this a bit differently to look more like a diffusion equation. my a to the m, and now I write my slope as s to the n minus 1, which now lets me write the 1 that I subtracted as dz dx. When I do that, remember slope is defined as minus dz dx, so I get to make <coughs> minus sign positive right there. Now, the point of doing that, and I hope it was worth writing that up, is to simply be able to say, you know, now, oh, I forgot to put in, in my exuberance to try to save space, I screwed up. Because, D by dx here. Okay. So this doesn't look like a simple diffusion equation, but it's starting to resemble, or you might. If I tell you this kind of acts like a diffusion equation, you might be inclined to believe me. That is, we do have some uh, fluvial component of erosion that is dependent on topographic curvature. It's just that it's also dependent on other things that change in space, like contributing area and any sort of extra slope in our transport flow. So like, for example, in your total load equation uh, from your labs, if it's slope to the 1.65, then we'd have slope to the 0.65 here, slope to the 1 here. Okay. So this is going to act like a diffusion equation. And it's going to act somewhat fundamental. Well, it's going to fundamentally behave differently from this one. The reason I bring it up now is because this will become important when we start to talk about the time scales that these different erosion laws act over. And this gets to the difference between that four million years until we reach equilibrium in Taiwan versus mountain ranges lasting for 500 million years. Okay. And um, you know, just to skip kind of into the answer without telling you how we exactly we get there, the difference is these two equations. Right? This one is fast, this one is slow. This one we get to use when we're 
actively doing uplift, this is the one we have to resort to when it <coughs> turns off in general. And while I've put in uplift, anyway, that one behaves more slowly. All right. Is in its heart of hearts, it's a diffusion equation. It wants to, cons it has to conserve mass. It has to do all that complicated bookkeeping. And just bit by bit, add a little more as we go downstream. OK. So let's look at what these different sorts of stream equations imply. In both cases, let's consider a simple case. Let's consider the case of a balance between uplift and erosion. Drawn that, written that into both of these, right? Driven, written into both of these that we may have uplift and the erosion term that gets complicated here, relatively simple over here. Okay, so if uplift balances erosion, then over here, and start with over here, I can write, well, if if uplift balances erosion, what's dzdt equal to? Zero. Zero, yeah, I mean, I'm essentially saying, I'm defining the case where this totals to zero. And in that case, one way people have found to look at this and you know, say something useful is to solve this, this part, solve this equation now, for the stream gradient slope, or S. So let's just do that. that if we solve for slope, uh, we've got let's skip it, some steps here if you don't mind. Right, got S to the N equal to uplift over K and the A to the M. Uh, I want to get rid of that N, so I'm going to raise both sides to the power of 1 over N, which will just cancel that and give me a 1 over N here. And generally, we prefer to write this like so. Because it divides things into this being something like a constant term <coughs> and this being the term that is going to vary in a downstream. Attachment limited streams will tend toward having slopes or stream gradients decrease with increasing contributing area. And contributing area increases downstream, so that is, slopes will decrease as we go downstream. And that's consistent with at least our most basic notion of what a stream profile ought to look like. You know, if I'm going to draw a stream profile sort of rich, large, I'm going to pretty much almost always draw it like that. And you know that while that's me wanting to draw a concave profile like that isn't any kind of proof of this. This at least is consistent with our intuition for how stream profiles should be shaped. Right? The slope gets higher up here as we continue, as we increase contributing area. The slope gets more gradual. And that's essentially the the you know, if we remember the animation I showed you at the end of last time. If we were to solve for uh, slope, uh, if we were to calculate slope and contributing area at every point in that landscape, it would, in all those streams, it would make a nice straight power law line of this form. Ooh, I said power law. 
I'll get back to that. Now, over here, the equation doesn't spit out such a simple relationship in steady state. If I set that equal to zero, I continue to scratch my head with what to do next. So I need to use a little logic here. Um, so at steady state, <coughs> transport capacity must be sufficient to carry not only what uplift provides locally, but also what uplift provides to the whole area upstream. Okay. That's maybe something I can solve. I can just say, okay, my, uh, my transport capacity Well, let's write it this way in words first. That means that our transport capacity is just uplift times contributing area. Okay. Um, I wanted to get this neat and nifty. Uh, let me move. remove this. So, yeah, like that. So that means again, writing it down math-wise, uh, I better throw in. Uh, Let me skip that part. So transfer capacity got written right there. KT A to the M S to the N. And that's got to equal the uplift times the um, contributing area. To keep my unit straight, I better throw in a uh, factor of density. Could be wrong about that, but I think that's I think I need to include that. So it feels like I need to. Um, so now that I can just solve for the slope like I did over here. And so I get S to the N equals rho V U. So density uplift contributing area divided by that transport constant K sub T and contributing area to the power M. Uh, raise all this to the one over N power cross side N out. And now I'm getting something that's somewhat similar to what I had over here. still got in my sort of steepness term here, my uplift, I've still got that transport constant in the denominator. And I've still got a contributing area raised to some power. But now, that power depend, you know, whether that, okay. Over here, we were pretty dang sure that M and N were both positive. And so if we have a negative M over N, pretty much always predicting that we're going to have a concave stream profile. That is, that slopes decrease with increasing contributing area. Here, that's, un, that's perhaps in some question, because now I've got 1 minus m. So if m is greater than 1, then yeah, I've got concave. <coughs> I've got a concave profile. But if m is less than 1, then I'm going to have positive power in contributing area. That means my slope's going to increase downstream. So conceivably, at least, I could have a convex stream profile. Now, 
Now, do we typically think of stream profiles as being convex? No, but we love to go hike to places where they are, don't we? Like waterfall. So I'll just throw that out. All right. Now, we might now well ask, <laughs> okay, hmm, uh, what's the magnitude of M depend on then? Um, I mean, it depends on how contributing area increases downstream. You know, branching networks fill two-dimensional space. It's kind of limited in how different that could be from place to place. But, you know, keep that one in mind, I guess. Um, big one, of course, is how discharge is related to contributing area. So we know, so before we said, okay, let's see, how, uh, so discharge increases with contributing area, transport capacity increases with discharge, therefore, you know, we've got this contributing area in our, in our law, in our equation. Another important thing though, that and it turns out to be pretty important and will be uh, something you will have to consider a bit in your labs next Monday, is how does grain size change downstream? If it gets smaller, then we have what we call downstream fining, and that will tend to make M larger and favor a concave profile. If we somehow had downstream coarsening, then that would make our transport capacity less effective as we move downstream, or at least subtract from the effectiveness, and we might tend towards a straighter or even convex profile. All right. Let's look at what we should expect from each of these slope equations. Um, now, for some general dependencies, I want to focus on the simpler attachment limited case. It's just easier to see what's going on there. Um, and a lot of what we see there is pretty well transferable with some caveats to the transport limited case. So if we look at detachment limited case, the detachment limited case, we note that what, what we're saying with this step in our equation is that the erosion rate's equal to this k times a to the m, s to the n. All right, so let's write that down. There. Now, again, you remember to justify replacing discharge with contributing area, I pointed to our mass balance for our saturation overland flow. We said, well, for this small area where we're potentially generating overland flow, um, we're going to say that discharge is proportional to contributing area because it's been raining forever. Um, but if it hasn't been raining forever, it's not so, you know, wait, not so fast, right? Um, so it gets more complicated when, as we consider larger areas. Um, now, in general, then, we can still say, you know, discharge is a function of, say, runoff and contributing area. And we can write it like so. So, runoff, I'm going to say, to remind ourselves that there might be some deeper infiltration, some fraction of the P precipitation that we lose, you know, down the way. Um, put in contributing area. Typically, we do see that it is a power law relationship like so. 
So this here is our net runoff precipitation minus say, infiltration, but you could also say you know, minus whatever evapotranspiration, uh, even interception that stays in the canopy and never reaches the ground. Okay. Um, the exponent here, this C, may in general vary with the magnitude of the event. Like how big a thing are we talking about? Are we talking about a humongous flood? Are we talking about a sort of a run of the mill, big flow, what? Um, it just, just it depends on what we consider to be the sort of effective or formative discharge in the particular case. Okay. So let's look at some actual data. See how that runoff, that discharge part might affect our erosion and our stream profile. This is mean annual flood versus contributing area for stream gauges in the Puget Sound area. We get mean annual flood, you might ask what is mean annual flood? Mean annual flood we get from taking the annual flood series, that is the the, the, the gauge, you know, you go to the website and you get this, the series of the annual maximum flow for each year. For how, so if it's a 30 year gauge record, then I get 30 discharges in that series. Um, and then we just take the average of those, and that's the mean annual flood. So by annual flood, I mean the biggest flood of the year. By mean, I mean the average, mean annual flood, the average of the big floods of the year. Um, and so I plot that up versus the contributing area at each gauge and put it on log log axes so it'll make a power law fit nice and stick a power law to it and the solid line then is this, this equation up here. What does that say? That says that that, const, that C, that exponent C there is 0 0.85, 0.47 times 10 to the minus 1, 0.85. Okay. Here's the same sort of plot for gauges in the Ozark Plateaus, where I'm from. And here, so this is like northern Arkansas, southern Missouri, like northwestern Arkansas, southwestern Missouri. Um, and again, solid line here is the best uh, power law fit to these data. And the exponent here is 6.80 times 10 to the minus 1, 0 0.68. Because here, the C is smaller. That exponent is small. So we look back at our erosion equation. We recall that M. It's proportional to C. So the profile concavity, which is that ratio of M over N, which is hidden by the screen, right, is also proportional to C. That is a, the, the sort of scoopiness shape of that profile, right? If M over N is relatively small, near zero, then it's going to be just barely a curved concave profile. If M over N is relatively large, then it's going to be a nice scoop, snow shovel shaped profile. What does the dashed line represent? Like the second best I'll get to that in just a second. So, but first I want to ask, so which of the in which region would we generally expect the streams to be more concave? Here where it's 0.68 or in Puget Sound where it's 0.85? The other one, right? Okay. Um, now, you asked about the dotted line or small dashed line. To compare storm magnitudes, we want to make the fits have the same slope in each of these cases. If we want to say, 
you know, well, how big are the rain events in these two cases? I can't just compare the best fit constants because they're going to have different units. Because the units depend on that exponent. So what I do is I go, well, okay, the average of the two exponents in this case is 0 0.765. 7.65 times 10 to the minus 1. And so then I make the best fit with that as a condition. And so we see here the constant out front is 9.9 .9 times 10 to the minus 5. That's, again, that's the Ozarks. 9.9 .9 times 10 to the minus 5. Let's remember that. Go back up to Puget Sound. Here's the equation with, again, the common 0.765 exponent and the leading coefficient now 6.4 times 10 to the minus 5. About two-thirds what it is in the, in the ozone. As much as we think it rains all the time and rains a lot in the Pacific Northwest, it really doesn't rain hard. Not like it does in the southeast. Not like in the Ozarks where your big storms are essentially hurricanes coming up off the Gulf and having a huge orogenic effect, you know, when they're uplifted, when they hit the Ozarks plateaus and dump all their rain and you get, I experienced this nine inches in an afternoon. Um, that's when you learn whether the drainage on your property is <laughs> really like up to snuff. Uh, as, as it turned out, it was not. Um, all right, so yeah, so okay, now looking back then, looking at both of these, which area will have steeper streams? Well, where does that magnitude of the discharge come in? Here. Comes in through K. Because right? erosion rate is proportional to A to the M, S to the N. Everything that's not contributing area we toss into K, including the magnitude of P minus I to the C. Okay, so more rain, bigger storms, bigger K. What's that mean for, for slopes then? Bigger K, smaller slope. So in general, my, my streams will be steeper where K is smaller, where my effective storm magnitude is small. Now if that's a bit counterintuitive, um, think about it this way. Um, those, poor, those poor Puget Sound streams have to cope with moving all their sediment with less runoff to deal with. So if they had to all else being equal, if they had to move the same amount of stuff, they'd need to be steeper in order to cope with not having as much flow in those big storm things. <laughs> now, you might well ask at this point whether that slope equation is any good. Now you want to know. So let's first consider replacing some variables, um, or let me just quick scribble here. Um, I've got that s equals some constant times a to some negative power. I can just write that down as something like that. Or here the k sub s is equal to that ratio of uplift to k raised to that power 1 over n, and theta is just m over n. And we can also see how we could apply, since I've covered it with the screen, you might remember how we could apply the same transport, we could apply this to the transport limited equation as well. Since, and I'm, yeah, I'm kind of hurrying because I just want to let you get let us get to some of the cool stuff. So you might remember this one, this uh, lovely picture here. And that is right there. You might, if you look closely, remember this bit of the coast range where that southern part of the, of the landscape is pinned behind these two waterfalls. North Fork, Smith River Falls, Kentucky Falls. 
On the north side, we get nice bedrock streams like this. And that stream was somewhere along this main stem here. This is Knowles Creek. Now, let's look at what that profile looks like. Because remember, we've got active capture. That, that divide is probably moving south at some rate. We don't know what. but So here's that profile along Knowles Creek from field survey. That's not from digital elevation models. That's from actual survey long profile for the hand level and tape and stay rod and all that. So chunk, chunk. we plot that up as slope versus contributing area. And this bit gives us this line, this scaling relationship. This one gives us this one. Now what the heck's going on? Remember we've got active capture, right? It means we've probably got nick points moving up that stream from the north. Moving towards that divide, tearing it down, moving that divide south, and taking over pirating North Fork Smith River. This is sitting up here at that old lazy slope of North Fork Smith River. This is at the new exuberant slope of Knowles Creek from the north. So we've got this nick point moving up here. These have different slopes or different intercepts to them, different values of this K sub S. This one has a larger K sub S, which would correspond to a greater overall erosion rate, which we can represent for that landscape as that U-turn, that uplift turn. What is the uplift rate that is effectively felt by this stream? Here it's large, here it's small haven't gotten there. The signal hasn't reached it yet. So we can see how an effective uplift rate or overall erosion rate changes these. We do get these nice power laws of slope and contributing area. That's a thing. Um, moreover, when we look at the details and the bigger ge geologic landscape wide picture, we get an interesting story. We get to help explain some of what's going on. All right, I'm totally out of time. Sorry about that. Next time, um, I will talk. I hope I'm. You know, I really want to get to the last question. Like, you know, what are the time scales here, and, and so on. Like, why? You, how can we have mountains evolve relatively, relatively quickly and then decay over such long periods? All right, have a good weekend. Again, I will post an announcement when the quiz goes live.